I still remember the day when I made my very first scientific discovery. It was 7 p.m. on a Sunday, and as usual, I was doing my monkey electrophysiology experiments. I saw something phenomenal in the data, and I barged right into Chris's office. I didn't even knock. Hey, Dr. Pack, I just discovered component selectivity in area MST. In the action potentials, he said? No, man, in the local field potentials. I responded with enthusiasm. Dr. Pack had this curious look on his face. You see, our hypothesis had failed. I had just found the opposite of what we expected. Although I knew that Chris was amazed inside, he didn't show it. It was the usual dissatisfied suspicion of a professor. It was impossible to please him. After all, he was this young, Harvard-trained, tenure-track neuroscientist who had already published in Nature twice. And I was his first student. He expected the best of the best. Go find me 20 more of these units so we can publish this thing, he proclaimed, as he was about to shut the door so he could go back to watching the Red Sox game. But I had to ask him something. So I looked at him in the eyes. Hey, Chris, what if we find the opposite result? And what he said next changed my life forever, both as a student and as a human being. He goes, no problem. Don't worry about the result. We'll publish as long as we tell a convincing story. And that, my friend, is the crux of science. If you tell the story right and you back it up by previously published studies, your data can convince anyone. And when it comes to the science, there's always past evidence to support new results. But when you bring in politics, power, and pussy, science becomes a whole new ball game and you should take it with a grain of salt and use your own brain. And you wouldn't know these things unless you've actually done a PhD. And in this case, I got very lucky because I worked with Nobel Prize winners from Harvard. So I was trained by the best to detect bullshit, especially the nasty smell of bad science and faulty logic. Which leads us to Dr. Paul Saladino, MD. For those of you who don't know Paul, Here's a brief summary. Paul is also known as Carnivore MD. He wrote the book, The Carnivore Code. His residency was in psychiatry, which is interesting because he's teaching nutrition, but more on that later. He's in his mid forties, ripped with a six pack. He's charismatic, handsome. So you can imagine why he's the reigning leader of the carnivore cult. I mean, he's even been on Rogan, but unfortunately guys like Rogan don't have the scientific background to debate and confront doctors who use big complicated words all the time. Most humans bow down to such authority, especially when there's an MD after the name. Same shit happened when Paul was interviewed by one of my mentors, Elliot Hulse. Rather than challenging Paul on his logic and science, Elliot bought it, straight up fanboy. So as a tribute, to Joe and Elliot and every other person who has been fooled by Paul, I've made this video to dismantle Paul's claims and debunk his scientific arguments. So let's begin with plants. Paul, along with other leaders of the carnivore cult, doctors like Sean Baker, Anthony Chaffee, Ken Berry, and others, they stand united against plants. Paul is the only one who eats fruits along with raw dairy, raw honey, and of course, muscle meat, organ meats, and eggs. The other guys just eat beef. And recently, Dr. Baker added 100 grams of sugar to his diet. So Paul is a bit different from the others. He's not pure carnivore by any means. This is not a video against the pure carnivore diet. It's specifically regarding Paul's false claims and deception to his followers. And you may be one of them. Paul's carb consumption is around 300 grams per day. He used to only eat meat and call himself carnivore, but he suffered from heart palpitations, sleep problems, and low T. So he added fruit, honey, and raw dairy to fix all of these problems. And because of the added carbs, he now calls himself hashtag animal-based. Take a look. And I eat a Paul Saladino diet, which, you know, I guess, the technical definition would be a paleo diet because you eat lots of meat, lots of seafood, but you also eat a lot of fruit. 
and you eat not really food. paleo because I don't eat any vegetables. I call it animal based, you know, Oregon. No, you are eating vegetables, but you're eating. No, I, I don't eat well, vegetables. I mean, I mean, fruit comes from vegetables. No, but fruit right. isn't a vegetable. It's different, right? Vegetable is leaves yeah. and stems yeah, but and it's roots, a plant, right? And so right. It, you you plant are eating a, you are eating a, a a a mixed plant animal diet. Yes. Yeah, and which many people would call that paleo, uh, but I, I think it's fine to call that just a I don't know what, what that should be called a, a fruit based carnivore diet or a meat based omnivore diet. And it's omnivorous. That's what it is. Animal that's, based. That's, yeah, I think that's fine. Animal based. Animal based. All right, enough fooling around. Let's break down the science. Vegetables, even leafy greens like kale, kale's bullshit. You guys have seen me with that t-shirt or that hat. I don't think it's great for humans. It contains compounds of the family from isothiocyanates that will inhibit the absorption of iodine at the level of the thyroid, which are isothiocyanates. Now, how does this work? These are plant pesticides. Before I prove to you about how ridiculous this is, let me teach you something important about life. A life lesson, if you will. When someone uses big words like isotheocyanates, our human brain is wired to believe that they have authority over you. Let me demonstrate. You remember that? I said this earlier in this video. In the action potentials, he said? No, man, in the local field potentials. I bet you thought I was real smart, eh? But you're never gonna look up what I said, are you? You're not gonna read any of my publications. You don't have the time. And you also don't have the scientific background to even understand what I wrote. In fact, 99.9% .9 of the world has no idea how to read scientific papers. You just have to believe people at face value. But don't worry, later on in this video, I will show you how to tell when someone is trying to pull a fast one on you. So when Paul says isotheocyanates are toxic to humans, you believe him. Did you even Google it, bro? Imagine, what if the truth is the opposite of what Paul said? What if Paul, who by the way is business partners with this guy, doesn't know what he's talking about? Turns out that isotheocyanates may be cancer preventing molecules that our gut microbes create from glucosinolates. And where do you find glucosinolates? Broccoli, cabbage, and other vegetables of the brassica family. And according to Dr. Justin Sonnenberg, this guy right here. There also is bile that's secreted. Um, that creates a, a different chemical environment and there are bile-loving bacteria that kind of live in that region of the gut, keep microbes in the right spot, and to allow nutrients and water to be absorbed. And so there, there's a, a many microbes in the gut that are not just good at attaching to mucus, but also good at nibbling on it, at eating it. Broccoli could be preventative for gastrointestinal cancer and other diseases caused by chronic inflammation. Isotheocyanates are actually amazing for us. Broccoli is great. I'm eating it every day. Either I steam it for five to 10 minutes, or I bake it in the oven, or I cook it together with my meat, especially grass-fed, grass-finished ground beef. But why should we listen to Dr. Sonnenberg instead of Paul? Well, first of all, Dr. Sonnenberg is studying the gut in his Stanford lab every single day and has the experience and proof to back up his claims. He's been doing this for decades. And by the way, I highly recommend his podcast with Dr. Andrew Huberman. Dr. Sonnenberg has also published his findings in peer-reviewed articles such as Cell. I've read his papers. The studies are phenomenal, but he's not the only one. Many others have clearly shown the disease-preventing effects of this amazing ingredient inside broccoli. But no, 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 we should still listen to Paul. After all, he's a psychiatrist. He must be very knowledgeable about the gut and metabolism. Now, to be fair, my PhD is in neuroscience and I spend the last 10 years teaching men about how to boost their testosterone naturally. So when this happened- You're a medical doctor, is that correct? Absolutely. And you are a psychiatrist, am right, I correct? Right, a residency in psychiatry. So what do you know about nutrition? 
What is Where any... did you gain your background in nutrition? Listen, this is, I think... No, a... you listen to me and answer my question. Now I'm asking you I'm... to tell us where your background emanates from. What does writing articles have to do with my well, knowledge and Well, nutrition? because I could become you. I could be you as an expert because I read all of the data and all of the um, articles on this subject. Now I'm an expert? I felt it, man. Paul, bro, I feel you. And I have zero issues with you teaching people about nutrition. But you gotta be correct on the science and stop cherry picking the data. Let go of the carnivore ideology and stick to the hardcore science. All right, now let's move on to the next Saladino scam. That spinach is by far the biggest source of oxalates in the American diet. If you are eating phytic acid rich foods, you are swallowing condoms. I want people to remember that. So stop swallowing <laughs> condoms. <laughs> No, I hadn't gotten that far, but okay, all right. Stop putting condoms in your mouth, guys. It's a horrible idea. Don't swallow them, <laughs> right? Stop doing this. So you binding like it up, raw? Yeah, it's binding up minerals. Plant toxins would be things like lectins, which are carbohydrate, carbohydrate binding proteins. Stephen Gundry's talked about these, which can trigger immunologic reactions in humans. A bunch of digestive enzyme inhibitors, a bunch of oxalates and phytic acid, a bunch of toxins, to super problematic for humans. All kinds of issues, lectins. So he keeps talking about oxalates, phytic acid, sulforaphanes, lectins. Yes, more big words. And this is the same claim made by other carnivore doctors and influencers. They're so afraid of lectins. And it seems like the lectin monster is out to get us all. They're suffering from lectin nightmares. Even Dr. Stephen Gundry, who's been fooling us literally for decades, with this lectin nonsense. First of all, there are many types of lectins and they're known to bind to carbohydrates and attach to the lining of the gut and cause some trouble there. But only high amounts of these molecules can damage gut permeability, which is the hallmark of gut issues in humans and animals. But wait a minute, sulforaphanes can also slow tumor growth by reducing the ability of cancer cells to multiply. And this article from Harvard clearly shows that lectin-containing foods are associated with lower rates of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and these foods such as whole grains, nuts, and legumes also help with weight loss. And in the Harvard article, they're even making fun of guys who are writing entire books about how dangerous lectins are. To be honest, I think they're trying to warn people about how these guys are trying to scare us. <clears throat> Dr. Gundry, but here's the issue. You cannot look at food based on one ingredient because every single thing we eat has some ingredient which has been shown to have some type of harmful effect if taken in high doses. But vegetables don't have high doses of these ingredients. As I showed you, they can have beneficial effects on human health, especially our gut. So when you look at the scientific data, Look at what we know about the entire vegetable, not one single ingredient out of the thousands that this vegetable contains. And when Paul says we should stay away from broccoli, cabbage, spinach, kale, oats, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, rice, you name it, he even makes provocative videos like broccoli is bullshit and wears a kale is bullshit t-shirt. Brother, a vegetable that can prevent chronic disease in humans is not bullshit. It's miraculous. And then he quotes studies, but here's something he's not telling you. All of these studies are done on the raw form of these plants. I don't know about you, but I don't eat my sweet potatoes or oats raw. I don't eat rice raw. I eat cooked vegetables. I either steam, grill, or bake them, and sometimes I fry them along with my meat. And maybe once or twice a week, I have some green juice. And I try my best to eat only organic, and have been doing so for many, many years now. And for sure you wanna avoid the vegetables that are sprayed with pesticides, but that's not what we're talking about here. And, and by the way, I also love fermented foods. I eat kimchi, sauerkraut, pickles, and kombucha every single day. But once again, Paul argues against 
clear data. Let's go back to Dr. Sonnenberg for a minute. The big signal really was in the fermented food group. We saw all the things that you would hope to see in a Western microbiota and Western human. We saw this increase in microbiota diversity over the course of the six weeks while they were consuming the fermented foods. Um, and we can't always say that um, higher diversity is better when it comes to our microbial communities. We know there are cases, for instance, bacterial vaginosis where higher diversity is actually indicative of a disease state. Um, but we um, know in the context of the gut and for people living in the industrialized world, higher diversity is generally better. Um, we know that there's a spectrum of diversity. People with higher diversity generally are health healthier. If you can push your diversity higher, you're in better shape. And so we saw that increase in diversity. And then the major question is what happened to the immune system as these people were increasing their gut microbiota diversity through the fermented foods. Um, we, so we did the, um, this massive immune profiling and we see you know, a couple dozen immune markers, inflammatory markers decrease over the course of the study. So this paper by the Sonnenberg lab, also published in Cell, clearly demonstrates that our gut microbes can thrive and increase their biodiversity with fermented foods. And biodiversity is the number one marker of good gut health. And gut health is known to be the cornerstone of general health and well-being. And you know what? Paul actually talked about this study. Take a look. What about fermented sauerkraut? Okay, it's probably better than nothing, but remember that you are fermenting a cabbage, which is a brassica type of plant, which has defense chemicals, isothiocyanates. Those are mostly degraded when you ferment it, but you are taking a plant that is, I believe, toxic to humans, has plant defense chemicals. They are degraded somewhat by the fermentation process, but I still don't think it's the best use of that plant or the best source of fermented foods. I would rather have an animal food that is fermented than a plant food that is fermented in my diet. Wow, he clearly knows it, but refuses to believe it and continues to push that we should get fermented foods from animal products. Look, man, I f***ing love raw yogurt and kefir. I eat it all the time but I'm not happy with Paul's scientific dishonesty here. Paul could have said, hey guys, go try kimchi and sauerkraut and kombucha and fermented carrots and pickles. But no, he had to propagate his own agenda at every moment. And this leads me to the principle of indoctrination and narcissism. When someone tells you that it's either their way or the highway, that should raise some suspicion. You see, Paul is a fear monger and he's smart because he'll say stuff like, continue to do what you're doing if you're thriving. But if you're not thriving, and most people aren't, then I'm your Messiah to save you from the lectin monster. And this leads me to my final point. Marketers like Dr. Stephen Gundry and Paul who write books about this stuff basically waste years of their life believing nonsense. So. What is their fundamental claim here? They say that these ingredients, inside vegetables, have uh, defense mechanisms. Paul says that plants don't want us to eat them, and thus they contain toxic molecules which are designed to poison the animals that eat them. No shit, Sherlock. And then he and his fellow carnies talk about how we would die if we ate some random plant in the jungle. Well, duh. Dude, I still remember when I was in Ovruj, which is this little town in Ukraine a few years ago, we went mushroom picking. And uh, I still remember Sergei's dad. He always knew which mushrooms were dangerous and which ones were edible. And I even saw some magic mushrooms there. And I don't know about you, but I don't think an animal goes into the wild and starts chewing on random stuff without proper inspection. And the brain dead humans in the past who did that, well, they're dead. And they sure didn't pass on their genes. On the other hand, your ancestors and my ancestors knew their environment. And there's a huge difference between the relationship and connection they had with the wild and the modern folks today who are watching Netflix sitting on a couch. You can't compare those two. And here's the big thing that all the carnies, including Paul, 
have missed completely. Well, either they missed it or they purposefully left it out since it did not support their agenda. Technology, bitch. We cook the damn vegetables. We invented fermentation more than 12,000 years ago, for God's sake. Fermentation destroys 95% of lectins. But Paul didn't tell you that, did he? Even standard cooking procedures, which most of us today are using to prepare our vegetables, can greatly reduce lectins. Now, I'm not saying that vegetables are for everyone. There are some people, like my wife Martha, who has a really hard time digesting broccoli. Fair enough, it's not for everyone. But that doesn't mean it's not for anyone. Also, not all lectins are bad or good. There are many types and subtypes of lectins. But Paul groups everything into one bucket. And that's really dishonest and misleading. And here's another huge thing. Something fundamental that they've all completely missed. Did they stop to wonder why do we have so much data proving the health benefits of vegetables? And not just cooked vegetables. A lot of studies of raw vegetables show how amazing they are for disease prevention and longevity from predators. But Paul says, vegetables have defense mechanisms to protect themselves from predators. Since plants can't run away like animals, these mechanisms are their weapon. Well, great. If a plant is trying to protect something, maybe that is the real nutritional value. Plants aren't interested in protecting fruit. That's for us to eat. Fruits normally just fall off the tree, right? Plants want animals to eat fruits because they'll poop the seeds out since seeds cannot be digested and spread the genes of the plant geographically. Damn, they're smart. But what if fruits weren't the actual prize? What if they're just a bonus, a bribe, to keep the animal away and be happy with the fruit? But we are greedy animals. We don't just want a bonus, we want the whole thing. So rather than giving up and saying all vegetables are bad, what if we use technology like fermentation, boiling, steaming, baking, to extract the good and leave out the bad? Isn't that what the human brain is designed for? To get the best stuff from nature so we can thrive and live long, happy, and healthy lives free of disease and chronic illness. You know, when I was struggling with low testosterone, my total T was 376 nanograms per deciliter. That's the total T of an 82-year-old man. And I had also developed liver toxicity. I was eating a lot of processed sugar, I was drinking alcohol while I was living in Vegas. And you know what saved me? Plants, specifically herbs. Herbs helped me double my testosterone to 801 nanograms per deciliter. This cured my erectile dysfunction, low libido, and low energy problems. It also fixed my body. I went from being 50 pounds overweight to getting a six pack. You ever heard of Tonkat Ali? That's a damn tree. That's not part of the carnivore diet. If a tree were to use defense mechanisms to save itself, they must definitely be in the root. But we don't just eat the roots, dude. Can you imagine some idiot digging up a tree's roots and eating it raw? Makes no sense. We take Tonkat Ali from the Malaysian jungle and properly harvest it. We clean it. We extract the peptides. They're sophisticated machines for everything. And again, technology, bitch. And now we have over 25 clinical trials proving that our Tonkat Ali increases testosterone naturally in men. Other benefits include weight loss, muscle gain, enhanced libido, and energy. And I fixed my liver toxicity with fermented Hushu Wu. And how? Well, there's a traditional brewing process in which they take black bean sauce and use it to cook Hushu Wu for 25 hours. And then there's a 15 hour extraction process after that. The whole thing can take four or five days of preparation. You cannot just eat the roots and leaves of Hushu Wu raw. That's nuts. You gotta purify it through traditional fermentation. The ancients have been doing it for thousands of years. 
And I'll tell you honestly, these plants saved my life. If it weren't for herbs, I would still be a degenerate gambler wasting my life away in Vegas, trying desperately to get some girl to like me. I would have still been a virgin. So anyone telling you to take vegetables out of your diet is not looking at the science. They're cherry picking simply because they don't want to eat vegetables, which is totally fine. You do you, bro. But they have no right to deceive the rest of humanity. You know, there's an argument that every single religion in the world has some connection to plant medicine. You've heard of ayahuasca, abigain, peyote, magic mushrooms, and other psychedelics, right? As we speak, Johns Hopkins, Harvard, and other scientific institutions are using psychedelic plants to treat and heal so many people from horrible mental and physical disease, especially old people. So what are you gonna do? Believe a bunch of cult members acting like babies because they don't want to eat vegetables? Or legit scientists who are using plants to cure human disease and help us live happy lives? And please listen carefully to what I'm actually saying here. Look, I love meat. I eat beef every single day. And I love raw milk. In fact, I was drinking it while I was writing notes for this video. I eat fruits daily and raw honey and of course beef liver, but I also eat broccoli, steamed or baked, and kimchi, pickles, carrots, zucchini, eggplant, spinach, arugula. Not a big fan of kale though, so no kale for me. Remember, when a plant is protecting something and his defense compounds are inside that, Maybe those are the exact compounds we need for our defense against cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's. And my friend, this human brain, the ability to use technology to extract the good and destroy the bad inside these plants is the key to a life of abundance and success. Thank you for listening and uh, I hope to see you soon. Take care, buddy. I wish you the best with your health journey. See you next time.